It is Wednesday, July 8th, 2020. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was yet another exciting Get Your Ass Kicked by Jiu-Jitsu Wednesday. I'm definitely feeling my injuries, man. I'm feeling my injuries on my ankle, feeling my injuries on my knee. But it feels good. It wasn't quite as intense as uh, last class, but I think it was because the last time we were just drilling. Me and my partner were just drilling and drilling and drilling, and then doing some more drilling, and then some more drilling, and some more drilling. And and really, there wasn't a whole lot of break in, in, in there. You know, it was just like, it was pretty continuous. And... Um, you know, I always like it when I when I get like positive affirmations from the the person that I'm training with, where you know he's like, "Dude, put in a lot of good work today." And I'm like, "Yeah, that 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 feels good," you know. And uh, so yeah, today we did some stuff, and I I had a lot of trouble with it because it, it was coming in from a. Um, from a standing position, um, gripping the wrist on one side from like a cross grip kind of thing. And um, at first we were fucking up. Like we weren't doing the, um, me and my partner weren't doing the uh, the one part right where you take your uh, your right hand and if you're, uh, your opponent's weighing that arm down where you kind of flick it to the outside and then come to the inside and grab the other hand and then straighten that arm out with it up against your chest and then like really weighing down on it and then a little bit of an ankle pick and uh, I, I was getting a little too slick on it you know and I think it was just because you know by like the the 30 or 40th repetition or whatever the fuck we were on uh, you, you start kind of just feeling it's like okay and going through the motions kind of thing to get to this next part that we're working because we were we were doing it by parts you know first was the takedown then then was the progression of getting the the um the knee slice and uh, then progressing from there to various submissions and uh, we we covered too we covered the um it's like a uh, a hip walk or something I don't know how to explain that one because you have your your uh, feet hooked around the back of one of the knees, and then you like you reach reach back with your your um, knee, and you scoot their um, their lower leg up. You know, you kind of like hook it around it, and then you grab a hold of the foot, and then you bend it back. <laughs> and uh, it's it kind of a kind of a brutal submission, but you're gonna tap to that if you get it right. Um, we did that, and then we did the uh, the arm triangle, and I was having a little bit of difficulty getting the right angle for the arm triangle, and uh, that's that's one of my favorite submissions in gi jiu jitsu is um, is the old uh, the old arm triangle. Just because it's kind of brutal, you know. <laughs> it's one of those things, you know. If you if you get it right on somebody, it's it's very not nice feeling. <laughs> very not nice feeling. And so, so yeah, it was um it was a very productive day. I felt pretty good about it, and uh, I'm glad to be continuing to do it. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down with some music. I, I haven't the slightest clue where we're going to go today. I got some tabs open in the browser, but I don't know how productive they'll be. It's been a little bit, uh, it's been a little bit freaky out there in the crypto zone. Well, some like, uh, like pre murmurs of people figuring out that there's these things called altcoins, and they can they can make money by trading them. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, yeah, that. That bit of excitement has been happening, and uh, I guess Doge really freaked out the other day. So, you know, it's a it's a good thing. I'm glad to see that that part of crypto is starting to evolve. Where I um where I believe we're headed next in this though is that we're only at the beginning of people figuring out about altcoins, and pretty soon they're going to be figuring out that 
their best and most secure participation in cryptocurrencies is has like a, a node, you know, that's staking or or a miner on on one of these proof of work networks. And uh, I think that that I, I'm starting to see some some glimmers that that's that's the next thing on the horizon. And I, I do believe that over the longer term, people are going to figure out that there it's only as secure as your participation in it. You know, if you're doing your due diligence, you're doing some code reviews, you're you're looking at GitHub and you're looking what the what the other people are saying about an implementation before you implement it. You know, then then we're gonna have healthy networks. But you know, if we have people just going by default settings and letting the devs set everything for us and dictate everything for us, we just end up with another head <laughs> hierarchy. Uh, similar to the one that we're trying to get out of, you know, where there's a a position of authority, you know, that can be monopolized, and I I don't really believe that exists anymore, um, especially with the fact that any anybody, any average Joe can can make a cryptocurrency. There's there's no age limitation, no realistic one anyway, and and it really comes down to what people are willing to participate in what they're willing to devote their hardware to, you know? Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down with some music. And uh, I want to go with something off of Carnivore. And I'm feeling like... Hmm. Hmm. Let's go with No Remorse here on Coin Metal. First Dance. And that was Static X with The Trance is the Motion. And so, as far as what we're going to get into tonight, I haven't the slightest clue. Got that volume just a teeny tiny too loud. I'm going to tone that down just a bit. Yeah, altcoins. Been freaking out today, man. Freaking out. I'm enjoying it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's uh, it's been good. It's been very good, although not as good as it should be. I I've said this on the show. I'm probably like the worst trader in all of crypto. I mean, I, I I've made a dollar or two, but I mean, I keep I, I've been in crypto winter too long, just too long, and I'm I'm like I'm I'm hitting sell way too quick. You know, and like, you know, and shit keeps going up after I hit sell and I'm just like, well, I can't buy back in because if I buy back in, it'll continue to go down. I'll continue to lose money. And, eh, eh. It's that fucking FOMO, man. I'm telling you that crypto winter was, was just hard. It was just hard. You know, and so I'm really glad that I do have jujitsu as an outlet. For you know, at least you know, with my my training partner and whatnot, I'm at least that you know, it's it, it's making me feel good that I have that because if I didn't have that release, I I wouldn't even be able to get what little little bit I do <laughs> or have, you know. So patience, patience, timing, and uh, it, my timing is off still. I'm just gonna say that. You know, I, I did uh, I did actually own some Doge, and I did actually make just a teeny tiny bit of money on that. But like I said, I sold out way too early because I was a fucking idiot. And uh, you know, by the time I was thinking about buying back in, it was already coming back down. It's like, eh, eh, I want that money, but you know. So, like I said, patience. It's uh, it's key, and uh, yeah. Anyways, as far as what we're going to get into for the um, the day, I do have a couple little tabs open here. Oh, oh, I thought this was really fucking entertaining. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, man. This is, this is, to me, this is like dangerous water. I mean, I, I've enunciated a multitude of times my lack of faith in DeFi and any of these quote-unquote 
second layer solutions and tokenizations and whatnot. I mean, th- especially ones with with weird, um, weird. Uh, what do you call them? I, I don't know any of the tokens. Any tokens? I, I'm not a big fan. And it's not. Um, I'll tell you, my my feeling on it is that the proper way to start a coin, you know, if you're if you intend to start a project and have people support it of their own volition out there, as the original cryptocurrency started off as, and a lot of them work that way today. If you want to launch that, you can't piggyback it on somebody else's work. You have to assume the full risk of what you're putting out there. And and there are a number of laws out there that that enunciate to you specifically what kind of activities require licensure. And the fact of the matter is, is that if you were to go back to the Bitcoin white paper and you were to assess the project on its face, there is no point for regulatory friction on Bitcoin proper. Meaning when you're doing a peer-to-peer transaction as Bitcoin was intended to be performed, uh, you would be doing so directly on chain and it would be for, the public would be able to see the transaction happened. They wouldn't necessarily know who you are or the person you were transacting with was. There are a number of ways that you can go about obfuscating exactly how you're doing the transaction and who you're doing your transaction with just on on the open blockchain. But there are entities that want to take that capability away. And it's it's because their model of their their entire like business model requires somebody in the middle who requires a license so that they can get the government layer in there, you know, to where they can they can add things like taxation directly into the transaction. It'll be completely, you know, you won't even see it, you know, because like the the price that you're being offered for whatever product or whatever will include the tax in it for your specific zone. I mean, they can do that now. But there are ways around that. <laughs> You know, and if if we are to assume that anybody is going to be doing it, you got to assume that they want everybody to be doing it that way. The problem is, is that cryptocurrencies are all about choice, and they always have been. You know, you have a choice as to whether or not you want to be a miner for Bitcoin. You have a choice as to whether or not you want to be a developer for for Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency out there. So anyway, all about choices. Some the, some of the choices that you're offered, um, I believe, are just kind of by default not good choices, you know. And so anyway, anyway, I got this thing. It's on uh, Cointelegraph.com, and this is by Andrei Shevchenko. So yes, penis. And uh, this is authored approximately 12 hours ago. DeFi lending platform enables. No collateral loans with new feature. <laughs> this is going to be good. Uh, the AV lending protocol recently launched a new feature called credit delegation. This feature allows users to provide peer-to-peer loans with no formal collateral requ- collateral requirements. Oh God, the scansion on that was just terrible. Stanny Kulchoff, the CEO of AVE, explained via Twitter how the system will work. The credit delegation feature relies on peers to enter into agreements between each other that allow borrowers to use the lender's credit line freely. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the two parties must enter into a formal legal agreement that would define terms such as repayment schedule, interest, and other necessary conditions. Through an integration with open law, a project to create legal contracts recorded on a blockchain, these terms can be formalized on-chain. The use of peer-to-peer intermediaries, (laughs) 
That's completely, that's, a, that's contradictory. That's like military intelligence, peer to peer intermediaries. Give me a break. Allows to circumvent limitations inherent to DeFi, where the protocol cannot recover the borrower's loan outside of the blockchain. All lending platforms require po post posting more collateral than is borrowed. Heavy, heavily limiting the possible use cases of blockchain lending. The intermediary takes ownership of the risk of insolvency for the borrower as the protocol can access their collateral, access their collateral. It is then up to the intermediary to recover the loan through other means. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Given the higher risk, the intermediary receives a higher interest rate from the borrower. You know what? 90% of zero is still fucking zero, dude. <laughs> DeFi in the real world. The uncollateralized loan model could help bring DeFi into the mainstream as it makes loans more flexible. In a conversation with Cointelegraph, Kolchoff said that the initial purpose of the system is to, quote, simplify the matching for credit delegators with borrowers that are both either institutions or businesses. The limitation appears to be coming from open law, which is currently only usable by businesses. He proposed that if the idea were to be proven, it would be expanded to a larger audience. Ave would, in this case, become the, quote, lending liquidity backbone for any finance to source liquidity. However, he noted that currently DeFi as a whole remains too small and, quote, the industry would need to scale quite a lot to bring it into the mainstream. He also argued that it's important that borrowers are able to convert stable coins into fiat with less fees. Pfft, Jesus Christ. These fucking people are, are just like they're they're building castles out of out of playing cards. And and you just remove the right one and all the shit collapses. Continuing on, Abe's efforts can be considered as one of the first initiatives to bring DeFi to non-crypto use cases. Oh, great, so we can pollute more of the market with this bullshit. Following initial proposals from Maker to onboard music royalty rights as a form of collateral, Abe has traditionally placed emphasis on DeFi composability, featuring flash loans and using other protocol tokens as collateral. See, I, I can actually think of a, um, a use case for something like this. The problem is always getting it to break even or getting people to pay in the event that they did not hit their expectations. A lot of this shit is experimental. You know, and <clears throat> it's built upon shit that's dependent upon other people's hardware. You know, it's like if you're not if you're not mining it yourself, somebody else is mining it. Somebody else with their own incentive structure, not necessarily all in your best interest. I mean, to some extent it is because they have to maintain enough credibility in order to get people to deposit enough liquidity for it to be worth it to exit scam them. <laughs> Here, now this <clears throat> this is another one by Andre, but it's March tenth. I'm I'm trying to find it something that tells me more about AV. And let's see here, go back to that AV lending protocol. See, I clicked on that and I end up with another article. Tether looks to match up with DeFi with AV integration. Well, maybe there's a link in this one. Let's see. Tether is now available on AV, a non-custodial lending platform formerly known as ETHLAND. The top stablecoin by market capitalization appears to be singling, er, signaling its move into Ethereum decentralized finance. Tether shared an announcement on the development with Cointelegraph on March 10th 
USDT's Abe's existing offering of day USD, TUSD, and SUSD stablecoins. Paulo Arduino of, at Tether told to, Cointelegraph, I believe that DeFi is one of the most promising markets or technologies that are rising at the moment. The entire ability of having on-chain exchanges and loan issuance is a key element of growth for the entire crypto system. It's normal for Tether to try to lead the space or be the most used stablecoin in this space. Actually, I think stablecoins are fucking securities and they should be banished from this space. They should not be considered cryptocurrencies, nor appropriate intermediaries or proxies for U.S. dollars or other fiat currencies. But that's that's just my my feeling on that. You know, it, it would be different if your employer paid you directly in USDT. Because then you would have as much access and you wouldn't be converting one thing to another via a proxy. You know, where you're using like the the Tor, Tor system, or not Tor, uh, what's that one? Um, <clears throat> not Tor, the, the people that bought, um, not Tor, the, uh, shit. I'm trying to think of what it was. Isn't the Pirate Bay? Um, it wasn't Napster. It was something like that. Um, fuck. It's all. It's like on the tip of my tongue, and I I know somebody is like shaking their fist at their monitors in it. Um, it was a bit torrent. Um, or no, the damn it, Tron. There you go, Tron. Where they're they're enabling USDT, and I I don't know if they're doing other stable coins or not, but I know they're doing Tether Exchange on their network, and so I don't trust any of that shit. You know, if it's not something that is mineable, just like Bitcoin, um, I I don't trust it. You know, because the fact of the matter is, is we have no idea whether or not Tether is solvent. And the chances are that they aren't. You know, that they're they're running by on, on fucking credit on both ends. You know, they don't have the Bitcoin and they don't have the Tether. That they're operating on fractional reserves of both. I mean, they don't have the, the US dollars. And so, yeah, I think... Um, I think all it takes is for, for just one of the supposed financiers to either have a hack have an exit scam or their their legitimate lenders or legitimate interfaces with the legitimate legacy markets are cut off and it would seem that there there's no chance of that just because the the of the shadiness I would say of certain entities behind tether and whether or not they're actually connected with elements like the CIA or and, and I know that's kind of like out there but people have actually studied this stuff and ha- have put it back out there <laughs> you know it's it, it's all it's all out there for you to find if you if you look but um I I've been saying this on this show and and I'm going to go through this article without coloring it first just to see if it is an affirmation of, of what I've been saying on this show. Continuing on, this is by Michael Kaplikov, or Kaplikov, uh, so yes, penis, and uh, this is on Cointelegraph.com. Crypto OG thinks altcoins will outperform Bitcoin in the near future. The founder of the first crypto venture capital firm believes that altcoins will eventually provide better returns than Bitcoin. Dan Moorhead, the founder of the first crypto venture capital firm, Pantera Capital, believes that altcoins will outperform Bitcoin over the next couple of years. Speaking to the unitized virtual event, Moorhead said in the short term his firm is betting on altcoins. Quote, and it's in our opinion that these altcoins, and particularly small cap smart contract tokens, are going to outperform Bitcoin over the next couple of years. 
Um, I, I don't believe that's true. I believe that the tokenization gimmick is going to get nailed, um, either by the SEC hammering down further with their regulatory efforts and redefining shit into where even more of the market is canceled out from being able to, to participate on that level. Um, but yeah, anyway... And it's our opinion that altcoins, particularly small contract on that, blah, blah, blah. Um, portfolio altcoins are up 100%. He emphasized that it would be incorrect to suggest that Pantera does not believe in Bitcoin. Rather, they are of the opinion that smaller coins will go up in value more. Quote, we think Bitcoin is going to go up a ton, but altcoins will go up even more. An example is, Bitcoin is up about 30% year-to-date, which is amazing. Given that equities are down and real estate's down, and almost all assets are down in price, but other things in the cryptocurrency space are up much more. Ethereum is up 80%, and then other smaller projects like Augur and, and Zero, 0x, or Zerocash, I guess, or Zcash, Zero uh, X anyway, are up 100% in, on the year. Pantera is an investor in Augur and OX, however, it missed out on Ethereum, initial coin offering, back in 2015. Digital assets outperforming traditional asset classes should incentivize more institutional interest in the space. Actually, I think it's going to interest a lot of consumer level people. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, as far as uh, as far as that goes, I think that we are going to see more more of the traders that are in the, of the class of like uh, Robin Hood tra- traders are going to be investing more in cryptocurrencies. As a matter of fact, I would wager that that's what we're starting to see with the recent spikes in coins like Doge and uh, XDN and a few others, uh, Verge, you know, I love Verge, got got plenty of it, anyway, <laughs> um, I, I think that when we, we look over the longer term, people are going to start utilizing these coins as actual money, you know, and I, I know that's that's like the long bet at this point, but that's really where we've been heading. And when these when these altcoins start seeing you know dollar parity, even the smaller cap coins are starting to see dollar parity. Um, you know, shit like Ripple, <laughs> you know, or Digibyte. If Digibyte ever got to dollar parity, um, you would be seeing a lot more conventional interest in altcoins. And I, I think when we we do see that migration, and and I do believe we will that people are going to start recognizing that trading alone isn't necessarily or at least you know on the on the altcoin exchanges or whatever or defi markets isn't necessarily the most profitable way to participate you know i mean cuz you're you're not really a market setter when you're doing that okay it's in some some way shape or form the market is dictating to you what price it wants or it's willing to accept. And so when you're doing it from a mining perspective, you are dictating to the market what you are willing to accept for the coins. And this changes your dynamic with the market because eventually they will hit your price. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. You know, but... I mean, and you're talking to, like I said, the worst crypto trader in all of crypto. I've held positions on an altcoin exchange for 16 fucking months. And I, I, to a lot of people, that sounds fucking crazy. But, you know, it's like I'm I'm looking at the chart. I still don't really know how to read it. But I can see that there's this little bump in it that it happens. And it really hasn't gotten above three Satoshis. But I know... I know sometime in the future it's going to get up to 16 and then it's going to drop really sharply. So I'm going to go ahead and put my sell price in at 16 now and and just like disregard all the action in between and then wait for it to happen. And when it does happen, then I'll flip it around and, you know, I imagine that I'll buy back in at about four 
and wait for it to go back up again. Or, you know, wait for it to come back down to me. When it hits, it hits. And, you know, that that's a way that I've traded. But, you know, like I said, that, just, that took like a year and a half for that to complete. I mean, the first half of it took a year and a half to complete. The second half of it took about two weeks. <laughs> and so that, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and I made a lot of money on it. <clears throat> But that was like one trade out of like, I don't know how many trades I fucking lost money on. So, so. I mean, I, it was funny. I saw that on Twitter the other day is that, you know, one of the one of the options on this uh, multiple choice thing um, was suggesting that traders would give it all back. You know, like if if a millionaire was made in crypto, you know, what, C, would they give it all back? Yeah, C is likely that they'll be <laughs> giving it all back. Um, at least over the uh, the longer term. But I just I, I saw this one, and um, I expect this kind of thing to happen. Is I I think that the difference between crypto and a lot of other commodities or or assets out there is that you can take direct access of them electronically. Somebody can send them to you electronically, and nobody else can have them. Because that's possible, because delivery, fulfillment, is that much more possible than it is in other assets like, say, oil or or oranges or some shit like that where, you know, at some point you're paying the market to get rid of it because you, you don't want to take physical delivery. You're just like, dude, please get the, I don't have any use for eight tons of oranges, you know, even though I've got orders for them. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody is fulfilling them. Come on, take these. <laughs> you know, the, when you don't have that dynam dynamic, uh, it's it's a whole different a whole different game. Anyway, so I got this thing here. It's on uh, news.bitcoin.com. Crypto derivatives volumes crashed thirty six percent to three hundred ninety three billion dollars in June, a low for two thousand twenty. And uh, this is by Jeff Jeffrey Gogo, and it was authored two days ago. So yes, penis. Crypto derivatives trading volumes plunged 36% to $393 billion in June, the lowest they have reached in 2020, according to a new report by Crypto Compare. The decline may be the result of a lull in investor interest, in the instruments during the month in review. In May, derivatives contracts signed by at least two, two people to buy or sell a digital asset at an agreed upon price in the future soared to a record high of $602 billion, possibly driven by the hype that accompanied Bitcoin's third happening in that month. Total spot volumes fell fastest, however, sliding 49% to $643 billion in June from $1.27 trillion the previous month. Holy crap, said the London-based data analytics firm. The bulk of spot trading happened on exchanges considered by CryptoCompare as low-tier and unregulated, accounting for about $466 billion of the volume, while top-tier exchanges traded $177 billion. So that's like, that's damn near a, th a, a 3 to 1, maybe close to a 4 to 1. Wow. Quote, spot volumes have gradu gradually dwindled through the month of June, now representing roughly half of the daily volumes seen in the previous month, notes the report published on July 6th. In June, derivatives' share of the cryptocurrency market rose 37% compared to 32% in May and 27% in April. Crypto compares said all crypto derivatives exchanges saw large decreases in trading volume last month. Bitmex reported the biggest decline of 50% to $51.6 billion, while Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME, which focuses on institutional investors, posted the least 
the least decrease with trading volume dropping 17% to $6.7 billion. However, Huobi accounted for the largest trade volume of $122.4 billion, down 38% from a month earlier. OKX and Binance followed with $107 billion and $86 billion worth of trades, respectively. Both the exchanges reported trading volume decline of over 30%. At Durbit, volumes crashed 43% to $8.8 billion. Institutional options volumes on CME hit a record monthly high of 8,444 contracts traded, up 41% since May. The regulated exchange said future volumes, as measured by the number of contracts, fell 23% to reach 128,258 in June. Deribit monthly options volumes tanked 17.8% to about $2.5 billion in June, quote, but this is less of a, de- of a decrease than seen on other derivatives exchanges that only offer futures products, CryptoCompare observed. Uh, what do you think about the declining crypto trading volumes in both derivatives and spot markets? Um, I think it's because most people are starting to get the hang or, or at least understanding, you know, the people that were trading in, in um, conventional derivatives and whatnot, that they're starting to recognize some of the advantages of working completely in unregulated terrain. And that this is foreseeable. This is completely foreseeable. And and I believe I, I'm gonna come I have got a prediction here that before long conventional and legacy markets and participants and regulated participants and licensed participants they're going to recognize that AML KYC is costing them money because as we can see here in this mentioned in this very article there's a differential of some 300 billion dollars of additional un- unregulated shit happening than there is regulated you know i mean really what why is the the legacy marketing mar- market losing out on that they're losing out on it because they're choosing not to participate in it. And I've said this multitude of times. It's like a, a continuing theme on this show. That if they simply let it go back to the regulatory level that we had in, say, 2014, we would see some significant wrecks. But we would also find out what's really successful and what really produces. You know, I mean, I'm I'm kind of like an invisible hander on this, that regardless of the number of interests that are introduced, regardless of uh, who the entrenched interests are at the moment, everything changes. And it doesn't matter what the regulatory terrain is. People are going to do what they are going to do in order to make a profit at what they're doing. It's why they are doing it. No profit, no motivation to do it. That's all there is to it. And when we're seeing that regulation is only costing us even the legacy players are going to see this they're going to say you know what it doesn't matter how many licenses we have it doesn't matter how many federal regulatory boards we've got with the fucking hand up our ass it doesn't matter how many lawyers we hire our software still isn't any more secure and when we get fucking hacked none of that shit protects us so rather than wasting all our money trying to create new barriers to prevent other people from getting into this shit, why don't we just try and make our shit the best shit that there is? Make our exchange the most secure it can possibly be. Make our exchange the most transparent and open as it possibly can be. 
and people will want to do business with us because we are demonstrating that we really give a shit as to whether or not we lose their money. And we care more about that than preventing other people from participating on the edges and, and us losing some sort of market dominance. And I know that's like some vast transition from the mental mentality out there. But really, the shit that protects people's money is software and hardware and the sentiment towards you. You know, and you can regulate those things. You know, if you're if you're charging excessively high fees for your shit, you're going to drive people to use other shit. If you're an asshole to people, make them wear masks coming into your fucking store, people are going to take their money elsewhere. It's a matter of incentives. You should be providing more incentive to participate with you in the market than other people. And it is possible. You can still make a profit doing that. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down with some music. And where we're going to go? I've been dying to play some fucking 12-foot ninjas. So here it is. One Hand Killing. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Zaman Marth. And uh, for some reason, I don't actually have all the metadata on that song. But, oh well. And so... What else have we got here? We've got a few additional articles that we can go over, that we will go over. And this one in particular I thought was kind of interesting, and especially in in terms of like DeFi and uh, and Bitcoin second layer solutions and all that shit. Um, the possibility of double spends. And so I got this thing here. It's on uh, Cointelegraph.com. And uh, this is by Enirud Tirari. Um, I'm going by the picture and the name. Yes, penis. Bitcoin double spends an inevitable network feature, legitimate or not. Reports of double spends, uh, double spending keep plaguing crypto firms and investors alike. Will this issue ever be resolved or is it here to stay? I think it's just a product of the network. Double spending is an issue that has existed ever since Bitcoin's inception. And according to a recent report from Zengo, it still persists across cryptocurrency wallets such as BRD, Ledger Live, and Edge. Although these companies have updated their product offerings since Zengo pointed out this discrepancy, it is speculated that millions of crypto users could have been exposed to this particular exploit named Big Spender. Ledger, one of the impacted crypto firms, even claimed this vulnerability is only a user experience flaw. Mm, we're definitely going to have to click on that one. What is double spending? Double spending is a flaw that arises across digital cash platforms wherein a single digital token can be spent more than once. Although this is not a weakness that is unique to blockchain and cryptocurrency, it becomes a very significant issue for crypto users. With centralized currencies, this issue is solved by having a trusted third party in place that verifies if the token has already been spent. With decentralized currencies such as Bitcoin, the unique selling point is they offer a system that is not linked to any central bank, with the double spend issue attempting to be solved by having many servers store up-to-date copies of the public transaction ledger. Actually, it's not supposed to be many servers, it's supposed to be millions of users. Continuing on, the hurdle faced by this approach is that once broadcasted, transactions will reach each server at slightly different times, and if two transactions attempt to spend the same token, each server will consider the first to be valid and void the second transaction. If these two servers were to disagree, then there would be no way to reconcile the true balance as each server's observation is considered valid. Cointelegraph spoke about the matter with 
Bilal Hamoud, founder and CEO of Index, a cryptocurrency exchange based in Canada, who said that despite reoccurring issues, Bitcoin does have a prevention system in place. Quote, Bitcoin Network utilized multiple measures to prevent such attacks, such as time to produce one block, which averages about 10 minutes, and a recommendation of six confirmations, which makes it near impossible to reverse a transaction unless the attacker owns a significant network hash power. Legitimate and Fraudulent Ways there's a myriad of ways that a crypto user or an entity can double spend. While some of these methods are legitimate, most are unsurprisingly fraudulent. Some of the well-known double spending techniques are race attacks, finny attacks, vector 76 attacks, and aforementioned big spender attack, and the main threat to the Bitcoin network, the 51% attack. <sighs> A race attack, known as a replace by fee or RBF attack, happens when the merchant or receiving party accepts a transaction with zero confirmations. It is the most common double spend where a user sends a transaction to a merchant and once the transaction has been accepted and goods are delivered, the attacker sends a, con a conflicting transaction to another address with a higher transaction fee forcing it to be validated before the original transaction. On this kind of attack, Hamoud commented, quote, These kinds of transactions are not always fraudulent. Exchanges like Index typically carry out these transactions as they control a Bitcoin node with a method that is, with a method that is called RBF, replaced by fee, to reverse a transaction whereby the transaction fee was low and they need the transaction to go faster or if the user of the exchange sent to the wrong address and the exchange attempted to reverse the transaction. The Finney, a Finney attack, however, is a fraudulent double spend that relies heavily on network hash rate and requires participation from a miner. This type of attack is extremely rare in the current scenario as it requires Bitcoin's hash rate to be extremely low. A Vector76 attack is also a rare attack in that it is a combination of Finney and race attacks. The main threat to the Bitcoin network is a 51% attack which could happen if a group of miners that control more than 51% of the network's hashing power agree to reorganize the transaction. This allows attackers to prevent new transactions from being confirmed by interrupting payments between some or even all users on that network. This attack also makes it possible to reverse transactions that were already completed, thus contributing to the double spend issue. One of Bitcoin's forks, Bitcoin Gold, has had its network hit by such an attack twice, in 2018 and 2020. On this particular type of attack and attackers, Hamoud stated that Bitcoin is unlikely to be affected by it. Quote, This type of attack is very unlikely as it threatens the entire network integrity. Such an attack can only be coordinated if miners decide to destroy the entire Bitcoin value, rendering it useless. Or at least enough of the miners out there. <clears throat> Solutions in Crypto The way that crypto firms slash wallets detect attempts to double spend is through the use of hashes. A hash is created by using an algorithm and is essential to blockchain management in cryptocurrency as these long strings of numbers serve as proof of work. When a given set of data is run through a hash function, there can only be one unique hash that is generated. Any tiny change to that data will create a totally unrecognizable hash when compared with the one generated originally. The algorithms used to create such hashes are called consensus algorithms. Despite the use of these consensus algorithms on blockchain networks, there have been several instances of double spends 
that have been detected where, where either the users or the firms themselves have been impacted. Gregory Klumov, founder and CEO of Stratus, an issuer of Euro-backed stablecoin, spoke to Cointelegraph on why the issue is still ongoing. Quote, there are centralized and decentralized risks. In the first case, there are several points of failure hacking into which you can take ownership or take assets or whatever else. In the case of a decentralized network, most of it must be taken under control to carry out attacks. There is no alternative, so debates are happening which model will be sustainable in the longer run. However, some believe this is to be an inherent flaw in the system. While speaking to Cointelegraph, Ev Evgen Verzun, founder of decentralized cloud platform Hypersphere, revealed, quote, This is one of the basic flaws. So system creators should always remember about it and design their consensus algorithm in a way to avoid it. Hamoud, however, holds a more liberal view on the nature of double spends, holding the attackers more liable than the system itself. Quote, Double spend is not necessarily an issue or a design flaw. The majority of users use double spend for legitimate reasons. Unfortunately, some bad actors do take advantage of that, and by simply following the rules above, like waiting for the necessary confirmations and dis disabling incoming, in incoming connections to merchant nodes can simply stop 95% of these attacks. What can crypto wallet firms do? Some crypto wallet firms or wallets could be considered merely a door to the blockchain or an access interface. There are only, a, only limited efforts that can be taken to negate the risk of double spending, according to Verzun, who said that wallets can implement rules that forbid setting low transaction fees or setting up a ledger system that places funds on hold. He added, quote, But unfortunately, there is no wallet that can foolproof Again, that can be foolproof as an attacker can simply run their own node or extract their seed oh. from wallet providers and use a third party to execute the attack. Since the current talk of the town is the recent RBF attack on various crypto wallet firms dubbed Big Spender, there are actions that merchants, users, and firms can take to reduce the chances of these attacks in the future. Hamoud echoed the suggestions made by Verzun, noting, quote, another measure would be to implement a cooldown period where the wallet provider prevents users from exporting their private seed within 20 minutes of sending a transaction or a payment, adding that, quote, merchants and users can stop these attacks by waiting for six confirmations on the blockchain. Some merchants and companies can also accept less than six confirmations by, disable, by disabling incoming network connections and making sure that they are connected to a well-established node. Oh, man, I got the yawns all of a sudden. Shit. Though these solutions are simple in concept, they are often extremely difficult to implement. It's now up to the security innovation processes of wallet firms, merchants, and users alike to determine the chance of these double spend fiascos happening in the future. These innovations should be a priority for all parties involved, given the monetary and, more importantly, reputational risks that impact merchants and ultimately the whole blockchain industry. Yeah. I um I think one of the efforts that could be made is to start focusing on specific coins rather than talking about this in quote unquote terms of blockchain. Cuz blockchain doesn't tell you shit about what project you're talking about. It doesn't give us any kind of characterization as to whether or not we're talking about a centralized entity that's running everything or a centralized group of entities that are running everything. You know, and it's it's simply not descriptive enough.
not for what we're asking. But yeah, so that's where that is. That there are, there are multiple attacks. There have been multiple attacks. There are attack vectors. But let's see if we can go go any further in here. Hmm. Uh, I don't know about that. It says, uh, well, this is on um, Cointelegraph.com, and it's by Adrian Zmidzinski and uh, Yes Penis. Ledger Crypto Wallet claims purported vulnerability is user experience flaw. Ledger's chief technology officer, Charles Goulmet, said that the recently revealed vulnerability is nothing more than a user experience flaw. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Fucking people. That. Leading crypto hardware wallet producer, Ledger, has denied that its product's transaction management software featured a double spend vulnerability. According to Ledger's CTO, Charles Gomet, the vulnerability recently revealed by software wallet Zengo is, in fact, nothing more than a user experience flaw. He illustrated the nature of its hardware wallet companion software, Ledger Live, to Cointelegraph. Quote, It's important to understand that rather than an attack, the actual flaw may be seen as more uh, more is a clever piece of trickery. Trickery is not a vulnerability. However, we do want to prevent anyone from falling victim to these kind of clever schemes. It's just a UX issue that could be used by a dishonest product buyer. These claims are not new. Zengo's claims are closely related to those released by Bitcoin Cash, BCH-focused firm Bitcoin BCH at the end of 2019. At the time, the firm's CEO, Hayden Otto, explained in a video how a Bitcoin point-of-sale solution misled merchants into believing non-confirmed transactions were final and accepting them. Like Bitcoin BCH, Zengo noted that Bitcoin's Replace by Fee feature can easily allow users to replace an unconfirmed tra transaction with a new one with a different target address that has a higher fee. It is worth noting that this feature only makes it easier to leverage the non-finality of unconfirmed transactions, a thing that is harder but still possible without RBF. Furthermore, Zengo's report also points out that RBF does not introduce any new vulnerabilities in, in itself and instead, quote, it explicitly puts the responsibility on wallet applications and users to identify unconfirmed transactions as unsafe. This is confirmed by Golmet. Quote, we want to thank Zengo for having responsibly disclosed this issue to us. We do want to prevent anyone from falling victim to these kinds of clever schemes. A way to prevent this, of course, is to make sure that any transaction is first confirmed. Ledger Live is releasing an update on July 2nd. A warning is now displayed on pending transactions. Zengo said it was awarded a bug bounty for bringing attention to the issue. As it should happen. But yeah... Um, I I didn't like RBF to begin with. Um, I I thought that it was it's kind of disingenuous to allow that kind of thing to happen, especially because one of Bitcoin's big selling points was the immutable nature of the transactions, and also the censorship resistance of them. You know, it's like if your if your transaction could be double spent. Or you could double spend your transaction. Somebody else can double spend to you too. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down in, into music. And you know, we haven't played any Megadeth today. Not any. And so we're going to have to fix that. And uh, I really like this song, Kick the Chair by Megadeth, here on Coin Metal. And that was Tool with Vicarious. 
And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. We will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole, because nobody else is going to do it for you. And so as far as our last dance is concerned, I haven't picked anything out. You know, kind of kind of flying it by the seat of the pants, as you know we do. And um, as far as our last dance is concerned, I haven't, I haven't narrowed it down. And so, I think... Oh, no, we don't have time for that one. It's way too long. But, no, we can't play that one. Um... I think we should go with Straight the Skies by Vola, Last Dance, here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. Good night.